My name's Roger Howe. Um, I started uh, British Rail 1971 as a 15-year-old. Um, went to work in the machine shop. Um, from the machine shop um, into the wheel shop, the lift and brake, and then back into the plate and section shop where I spent the vast majority of my time. I started in 1979 August and uh, I left four years later, just after, just in May, all uh, right, 1984. Yeah, I was um, 15 year old. I think I was one of the last school leavers to leave at 15. Um, I think the year after they left at 16. So um, we left school in the July school holidays and obviously the big factory fortnight, they had the holidays. Um, and then my dad said, you're going to work. Um, my dad at the British Rail was a big union man. Um, I think once your dad worked there, you know, you followed him. And after the factory holidays, the two weeks, um, we went down there on the Monday and I started work. Yeah, I was a riveter at the works. Um, and I worked, I did nine months at South West Durham my first nine months and then I came to the works and you did a year at three week spells at various parts of the works and then for the last year and a half of your apprenticeship you got put where would be your permanent job and that was down Stores Road for me, three roads, Stores Road under Wilf Mitchell. Well there's quite a few of us started about the same time on River Eden and we got put into groups, there used to be a river there, hold it up and then the river there, and we just got transferred about the, the shops. And uh, it was all right, I didn't like it like that. I didn't like that job. And anyway, they wanted some welders, so I ended up on the box job. I was in the last year of apprentices to ever finish our time at the works. So for our 40th anniversary, there was 12 out of our year went down to York, because that was our first ever way day at York. So that's why we went. Oh, that was great. South West Durham, fantastic. I love that type of thing. Uh, the engineering, I've always wanted to do it. I always like to work with my hands. And then, of course, when you get to the works, massive family. Everyone looked after each other. Fantastic place to work for. Camaraderie, just brilliant one. Uh, first started was a week's induction in mid-August. Uh, and that was upstairs from the canteen it was quite strange because my father was a, 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 a brain fog kicking in uh, one of the train training guys there so seeing being in that environment with a family member was quite strange and I also was aware that I would get that oh your dad's the the boss thing that I'd maybe given to kids at school who had teachers there <laughs> as parents. I started 1981 and 86 I finished working for the railways. We did first aid course, we got shown around the works, I can remember fire doing a fire drill and you got to uh, go on the horses and that, so yeah, at 16 it was good fun. The box job, that's where we were uh, young lads, we were all young lads in the box job. And then uh, I went into the top shop with your dad, lovely up there, we were all out the way. <laughs> but uh, we got all the good work to do up there, all the new wagons and that technical stuff. I always remember it, my first pay packet for the first week, just sitting in an office was uh, five pound. <laughs> and um, going home and my dad said, leave it on the, on the table, that'll feed you. <laughs> <laughs> and it went on and on from there. I think we started off at 39 pound, or something like that. You know, um, which wasn't bad. And then you saw the lads from Rufflands and that who went about 95 pound for the first year. How I started, um I went for an assessment at Bishop Orton Technical College, which I did. I then went for an, uh, an interview here at the works. 
and my interviewing consisted of can you measure this tape cassette in both inches and centimetres, which I did. I was then asked, did my grandfather still work in the machine shop? I said yes. He said, right, you start on August the 20th. So, my dad only ever took us to work one day, and that was that first day. And as I got out the car, he gave us some advice. He said, whatever you do, don't cause any bother here. Children Works is not called Dodge City for nothing. They're all rough. Another thing is, don't drink like it's what your mum drinks. Now you're in a man's world, now go to work, son. And that was the only day he ever took us. And that was the only bits of advice he ever gave us. There was nigh on 60 of us, and mostly from Shildon, Sonny Dale, so I knew loads of, of people anyway. So, yeah, you just, it was just good fun. You were out to school, you had a couple of months laid around doing nothing and now it was this new exciting thing at the rail works where I'd stood at the crossings as a young kid watching these wagons getting shunted in and out in awe you know being that up close to these huge machines you know you, you, you respected the elders they were teaching you how to do stuff and you just carried on and did what they said they had a laugh, they wound you off, but that's all part and parcel. You'll get your chance later on to do that, to somebody else coming up. But it's just great. It's absolutely fantastic. But you knew you were there as a place of work at the same time. You know, you had to earn a wage, which you did do. A lot of people say that the, the shops was lax. People got away with stuff. No, they did the graft. Everybody chipped in, did it. All right, we might have had to sit down, had a bit of crack on, but the job was done. They had a whale shop and which must have been, a, it felt like a mile and a half away. But then you had a break up yard which it looked like it was never going to end. And um, I think, unless you see the photographs of, or film, nobody will comp comprehend how big it was. Oh, I mean, it was huge. Absolutely huge. I mean, when uh, I, that, that my first one was, I came in, I was in the tool room in the machine shop. And then, uh, because I came a bit later, two weeks later, because I had holidays with my brother, who was in the offices. We had two weeks different holidays to everybody else. So I was like one apprenticeship on my own, so they put it in the tour room. And then I went to the um, Oxford Lane Repairs, and you didn't out. It was like going to tour, like going for a way, but at the Southwest Durham, learning everything. The next minute, you're in the tour room, tolerances, great stuff, to Oxford Lane Repairs which you were just sat in the corner. I mean, kind of blame the lads. They're a good bunch of lads. <laughs> it was just a case of there's nothing for you to do. There was ver they brought the work in. You did your stuff on your logbook, you know what I mean? You did that, and they showed you what you were doing. But I think when you're a fitter or you want to do something with your hands, you want to get in amongst it. You want to be saying, no, let me do that. Let me do that. But it just wasn't right. Um, when we were at South West Durham, um, how year was a bad year for apprentices. Um, we just used to vandalise everything. And uh, every single toilet door, bar one, was taken off the toilets. Out of 24 toilets, only one had a door, because we just vandalised them all. Because there were 60 odd of us went. And when we were spray painting, we had to make a toolbox, we were spray painting the toolboxes. But very luckily for me, I was a tech on the Monday, and I came in on the Tuesday when I got called into Ches Wells' office, who was in, in charge of South West Durham, he said, Moffat, you sacked. I said, well, fuck, what have I done now? What am I supposed to have done now? He said, come with me. So the frog marches outside, and somebody had sprayed my name in letters that big, in bright green, all the way along the wall. It was Johnny Peacock and Stan Stonehouse who did it, tried to get us sacked. Moff, punk, Sid Vicious, all right, because he'd only just died then. You know what I mean? We used to do things like that. Well, the first year was at Southwestern Training Centre. Uh, it was it was good work. You 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 went round different departments, fitting, welding, machining, and you win a group, and there might be three or four, maybe up to ten, depending on which group, BR lads. But you were mixed in with people from Rothmans, Cummins, 
factories from all around the northeast uh, so you got to know people from outside the area as well and you were starting to learn your trade skills uh, but be like the other apprentices were already had a, a trade assigned to them but at BI you weren't chosen you you weren't given your trade until you were assessed on your first year first time we went was when we had a big introduction for our year and we got like the size of it I always remember what I think myself like it's a, it's a mini city it, it was huge I couldn't get over how big it was um, but then like I say how we, uh, you only had a week or so two weeks and then you went to the Southwestern Training Centre for the first year so it was only possibly when we were 17 we went back to the railways although we still because we had to serve our apprenticeship in the first year was at Training Centre well my first job um, obviously had to do your induction at British Rail, uh, which was above the canteen. Um, my first year, um, we were down at South West Durham. We spent a year there. All, all apprentices who was a British Rail, um, they spent the first year there. So that was just whatever you really fell into, machining, electricians, fabrication. Um, and at the end of that year, you got a qualification, like well, I would suppose what it is now, your city and guild, um, part of your five-year five apprenticeship, then you went back to British Rail. And that's where you started. I went into the machine shop, um, the wheel shop, lift and brake, and spent five years doing my apprenticeship. So for this area, it was a... It was a blow. And apart from that, I thought, oh, get in. I'm at the railway as a job for life. Because, I mean, my dad worked for, for them. Um, so, that, again, the scale of apprentices, we had 60 apprentices during our year. Now, you look, you, you, if somebody gets a modern apprenticeship and it's only two years, it's worth the paper history, and it'd be fair. I mean, when you pay, people go to university, you want kids to uh, stay in the college and the uni till the year they know. I mean, they've got to know in some respects. But when you've got an apprenticeship, you're starting from the bottom. You're working it all out. Whichever apprentice it, it is, it doesn't have to be mechanical or anything like that. You know the job better. So you've got a better insight. You go to university, you read, it's in a book, it's different. It's totally different down to something physically. At the place of work, working your way up, you know everything. Whereas, like you say, if you don't read it by your book, it was to say that you know this, what's, what's the pitfalls? You, you never uh, sort of, what's the word? You never ex experience the way things can go wrong because it's just in black and white, it's not, not physically done. The first year of the apprenticeship was me from not being a child, because I live in West Auckland. I found it very tribal. Yeah. You got the four or five lads who weren't bothered straight away. They were all right with you. But then you had the... Oh, I don't know how to say it. Yeah. You could, couldn't be allowed to be intimidated by them. Because they, it, they, it was a... It was village life and probably like any village. You can live two and a half mile away and you probably don't like each other. It's just just the way it was. Tribal society, I'm afraid. Um, but then I eventually um, come around from this shy, quiet little, little lad that I was. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, it, it was... It was... Almost surreal because I still think at 16 I was still a, I was still a band. I was a I was a bit of I was a bit of a character then. I was a, a punk actually. I used to have like dyed purple and spiky black hair and all that. And I got put down for my permanent job down Stores Road when I was 18 and a half. 
And now I got put down there, uh, I, was, I was a riveter and there was 10 riveters and we all had to line up at the side of the repair shop. And Jackie Stainthorpe needed an apprentice riveter. And Jackie Stainthorpe was uh, a bit of a feared foreman. He had a lot of respect, but at the time I thought it was hard, but he was right what he was doing. And he walked up and down the 10 of us and he went, I love you. So he took us down to work down Stores Road, Three Road under Wilf Mitchell. And I had my overalls tied around my waist. I had a Sid Vicious sticking two fingers up T-shirt. And he said, oh, look, I said, oh, God almighty, what have I got here? So he grabbed all of us at the back of there, frog marches to the bottom end and put us working with a lad called Nogger Smith, Nigel Smith. Anyway, about 20 minutes later, he come round and Nigel said, you don't know what to do, son, you just watch. Because obviously, and then give us a hand and then in time you'll be able to do it yourself. So I said, fair enough. So 20 minutes later, Wilfred Mitchell creeps around. And bear in mind, he's a six foot five bloke, about eight and a half stone. Whispers in me, hey, is it cold, son? I said, cold. I said, no. Is it winter, son? Winter? I said, winter, it's the middle of August. Thumped us. Properly. Get your effing hands out your pockets, you lazy little bay, and do some work. He died nine years ago. The same, he died in the same week as my mum. And uh, I wrote his wife, Margaret, a letter to say what he taught us and all that. And that's what they read out at his funeral. And what he taught us is to get any respect, you first have to earn it. I genuinely liked it down there. It was a fantastic place to work. It had something, you had a camaraderie I could only think of if you worked down a pit or you worked or you're in like a regiment in the army or something like that. I really enjoyed it. It felt like a family to me. I, I thought it was a special place. It was the best place I've ever been. Well, first and foremost was... Uh, to respect your elders. You respected your elders. Because you, you... You weren't disrespected but you were aware that you were the bottom run uh, and you had to earn your stripes. But people wanted you to, to better yourself and learn. They wanted to help you learn as well. Uh, be working with people that I'd maybe been cheeky to as a kid, going down the street on my skateboard when they were telling us to sh shut up, I'm on night shift. Uh, and they maybe give you a rough time for that. Uh, which, you know, as you, as you get older in life yourself, you, those things come back to you. You see you, you it see you from another side. When we, when we went on with the youngest lads, like one of them, we were all about two, four, or ten of us. They used to be machines. They used to work these two to a machine. And you used to press a button and it used to weld. And that was making the boxes. But uh, as you progress, you go into hand welding, into the beers. And that's where you learnt. You learnt yourself in the beers. Well, there was another, t I did another two years on site, 81, 80, well, two and a half years on site. And that was uh, a quite, uh, as an apprentice fitter, it was quite broad based. You covered a lot of shops uh, because you could be placed in a, in a variety of places, you know, the repair shop, new construction. Uh, um. After my apprenticeship, um, I went in the plate and section shop, which was, um, it was a profile burning, um, which anything that, from wagon sides to wagon ends, any little bits and pieces that you wanted, which burning, profile burning in a big, in a big way, it all come through there. Then it went into the new construction where they would wheel, uh, weld it all together. Uh, I went in there at 18 year old into the plate and section shop because a big greedy and I knew they were on night shift and I wanted the extra money to follow my football team. <laughs> so I ended up there. We used to make accent boxes on the box job. It's where all the accent boxes were made and some of them were massive. 
<laughs> took two weeks to lift them. But uh, then from there, like when we got to 21, we just moved into different departments where they wanted welders. The first, me, my first placement on the site was in the wheel shop doing axle checking with a, a Call those things where they check for where they look at babies. Ultrasound, ultrasound yeah, with an ultrasound machine, and that was amazing to me. You know, a sixteen-year-old, a year lad, have a go of that, and you slap this gel on the end of an axle. You know, two huge wheels, and you put this probe on, rubbed it around, and you're basically looking for a peak at the start of a the entry to the axle, and ideally it had been level all the way through until the peak at the end, and any anything in between meant there was a flaw. So you, you were dividing whether they were going to be uh, scrapped or, or kept and reworked. There's no like, oh, I've got this to do, that to do, and no, no, lad. <laughs> you, I've done this before, get yourself back yeah. there. But you didn't really do it because you respected it because you know they did the job. You, there's no need to pull the wool over their eyes. It's a case of you total respect because they would say, look, hey, I'll show you how to do it because I know how to do it. It's not something that's coming from another factory or another place of work and says, hey, you do this and do that. And you'll say, well, you can't do it that way. And it's a case of you show us. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I know it in my head and I can write it down, but I can't show you. And I think that's the way to go. Whatever, like the steel industry, any industry that, that was back then. Like I say, now they should have more apprentices here. I mean, plumbers, uh, electricians, they're saying we short of them because they should have places where they should, the government should turn on, say, on proper apprenticeships, get them going and get the, the young doing stuff because there's a massive gap between the, the 80s when all the big industries were shutting down to the likes of now where we need them and what's the reason why? Because there's nothing in between, there's that big void. Yeah, there used to be three to a wagon. No Robinson. Uh, who was the other one? Ray, Ray Coll, I think it was. He used to get it. No, there used to be four men to a wagon. Bill Putnam had two inside and two outside. It had all the up to date machines in it. And yes, it did have a reputation of, oh, you work for that, you work for the shops, you know, you, you lazy fund. People worked together. If you had four wagons to get out and you'd finish your whole wagon, people would join in to help. So, once they get it, make sure you got it out the door. And I think it was just the way. Um, there were certain shops, that, again, a lot of people didn't like working in Newcon because there was a lot of Dalek people there. And it's this, this tribal thing. Um, we used to find them very aloof and just just different, I would say. Because after that, I worked at Doncaster for a lot of years, Derby, and I ended up being the engineer at York Works before that shut. But children was the best for me. They should remember the work because this was the one that was in profit. Um, a lot of hard workers went. A lot of hard workers and a lot of hard work went on. Um, if I take myself, I was there twelve year. I never went on the sick. I took my holidays, but I never went on the sick, and I wasn't the only one. You know, when people said they were going to be there at half past seven or nine o'clock for night shift, they were there. Again, it was getting you. I can always remember, I used to love having a pay pack and you used to have to count the corner, see if your money was right. Uh, just things like that, it was, it made you grow up, you know. Unfortunately now, kids don't know what that means, because they, they haven't got the opportunity. If this was still going now, I mean, Bishop Auckland children is still in the top 15 most deprived areas. And it wouldn't have been. Once, once the railways went, it was like a ghost town. Uh, heartwarming memory for me, because I lived right at the top end of the town. 
So it set off just me from the bungalows and then you'd be working your way through the state and at every junction people would be joining on. And the closer it got to the works, it was just a sea of blue overalls walking down and it just, you felt like you were part of something. You know, it didn't fit, you know, uh, later in life, you were driving to work in your car on your own thinking, oh God, but it was uplifting to see that. Maybe, maybe if you'd been, spent 20 years in the repair shop, you didn't have that, but as a kid, it was, it was a, real big thing to me. Um, I can remember getting off the Eden bus half, half past six, quarter to seven, and people walking down Barley Road, there was literally hundreds of people walking get getting ready for work. Um, and it did feel like the word community is banded about a lot, but it was a community. Um, and it wasn't just working for the railways, it was all the people, little like corner shops and everything. When work dropped off, you got sent where the labour run. It, uh, I was on in, working in the paint shop at one time. Ah, but what did, I, what did you do? I, I went out and wandered. I went yeah. up the lift and break, up past the whale shop up the stores, I'd look around. I mean, you couldn't hang around too long, otherwise somebody would have been kicking your backside for stopping people from working. But I remember being up the lift from break and uh, Mr. Hartfield, absolutely cracking, uh, gaffer he was. It's a case of, he gave me my first sort of spanners. It's like, as if, whoa, you, you trusted with proper gear, you know what I mean? And then you think to yourself, you had to come down for your bait, down the shop, and it was miles. You know what I mean? You're setting away and you're thinking, it'll be time to get down there. <laughs> I'm not going to have half my bed and I'll have to get myself back up like. To see as many people, and I can just remember the noise. Because, I mean, if you went in the forge, it, it was so loud. Um, and a lot of people from children who I work, who I work with in my present job, like the, some of the girls can remember the parents go, going, going to work at the shops, but you can always remember the noise of the foundry. Oh, I mean the forge. Yeah. I mean, I lived up in Alexander Street, and when I, I either rode my bike or walked down through the park, and as soon as you got the top of the wreck, boom, boom, you could hear the forge rattling away like, unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, the whole, uh, well, you, until like I say, it was all cracking on noise and everything, and then uh, obviously bed time, <laughs> you could hear the pipes bouncing away and stuff like that. And then after that, it was a case of noise, noise, noise. And then when you finish your shift, so it, it's not as if you could hide anything because you finished it early, because obviously the gaffer would have known, oh, come, there's nobody producing out there, there's no noise. But of course, he walks out, sees everything done, he's happy. Uh, I loved it, because uh, being from New Shilden, I played around the site of the works, you know, knocking about as kids, going up the fields and what have you. But it, Again, it was that sense of awe at, you know, walking the lines between shops and these huge wagons and, and wherever you went, people, you know, old and young sport, yeah, you know, all right, young and it was, you know, as been mentioned by many people, you, there was a real sense of camaraderie well, some people kept themselves to themselves, didn't like to be bothered with by young kids, but most people were very engaging and glad to have you on board kind of thing. It was absolutely brilliant. It was fantastic. If the works had still been open, I'm 63 now, I would have hoped to have still been there. Um, because it wasn't just working, you work in life. Um, you got up on the morning and you walked to work with people that you were working with and you walked home with them and when you went out on a night you went for a drink with them and when you played football as I did or you played cricket as I did you played football and cricket with them if you ever went out on your holidays you went on a holiday with a lot of the people it was a real friendly place and it was a place where probably if you were stuck somebody would give you a hand and I don't think you get that in 
many workplaces now, but it was a nice place, nice place to work. That was it, but they had strict gaffers there. They would talk about sergeant majors, that's what they were, ball arts. I mean, my mate Harry, we were skipping out, going down the canteen early, and my dad was walking down, and he went past me, uh, Harry went, all right, Jack. And he went over and says, Ah, oh, Mr. Stainthorpe to you. And he says, you might be my, best, uh, my son's best mate, but remember where you are. And he, <laughs> it was not like that big type of thing, but it was a case, okay, we knew, you know what I mean? I just keep it zipped. I just carried on walking, but it was just like that good, you know what I mean? It was just great stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's some stories you, you kind of tell. I mean, anyway. Little, what was it called? Wandless? He was a warnless. Elders. He was a kind of little fellow, Elders. He was in charge of us at the top shop. We went to the top shop with your dad and that. And he was a lovely little fellow. When I was asking him for a week off, I was getting married, he said, have you no more sense? <laughs> uh, say, that, like, working under someone you'd been cheeky to as a kid, and but they got to know you as a as a, a later teen, you were different to when you were 12 and they got to know you, you got to know them as not the grumpy old man who shouted at you. Uh, and you made friends along the way. You got to know people from surrounding towns and villages. Yeah, it was really good fun, r really friendly. Uh, the joking bit is uh, when we were in the, doing the, the three weeks of six weeks that we had to do going round, I went into the garage. So they, they have the practical jokes and stuff like that. And they said there was, oh, the uh, spark plug machine's not working, you've got to give it a rub. So, of course, you give it a rub, get your finger in the top, <laughs> you jump about two foot in the air, you know what I mean? And they are like in kings. But the, how many people have done that? <laughs> you know what I mean? How many people have gone for uh, the, the tap and clearance? All that sort of stuff, gone to the stores for it and that. Stood waiting and the old guys laughing the socks off. They must, if they had cameras then, they must play the back and think, got him, got him, got him. Uh, the, everybody, like I say, they're, they're the people that might be your boss later on. Because like you said, you, you work up, you can go up the ladder, you can start from nothing. But they remember that, but I think they remember the good side of it because it was just a laugh. There was nothing dangerous happening. Just a case of, like you say, practical joking. <laughs> <laughs> you could just, you just, we just used to do daft things, honestly. But everybody stuck up for everybody as well, you know what I mean? And you didn't, um, if anyone was struggling, you would help them and that, you know what I mean? I, I, I genuinely, honestly liked it. I mean, I nearly got sacked twice. Both times, actually, when uh, the head of the whole of the railways came. First time was in 1980 when Sir Peter Parker came and I was at the side of the um, machine shop and Sir Peter Parker was walking through so because I was a punk I thought sod this you know better than me so I deliberately cut in front of him he said who the fucking hell's that pardon the language who the hell's that anyway I got collared into the office do you know that is son he's head of the railways he's trying to get two million pound investment out of him to do the repair shop up do that again and you're sacked. Well, I got tripped up a lot. Not, not so much the ha having a laugh part, but trying to get away with things. I, I, I got caught maybe more than other lads because I think my dad maybe thought I should be shown a better example, being his son. Things like, you know, putting your clock card in block B, which was the nearest clock on point to the canteen. So you could get there early or get out of work early and that kind of thing. Uh, there's a few things that were played upon, yeah? Like when me and another lad were apprentices in the garage and they, they told us this tale that they needed some equipment that was stored on the roof and they got one of these Simon things and sent us up in the sky 
nowhere near the roof and left us there for half a day. Come back and rocked it a bit now and then. Uh, I didn't let on at the time that I was scared of heights because I just <laughs> thought they'd make it worse. Uh, yeah, but that was fun for them, shall we say. I mean, now you, would, you couldn't do it, but on a Friday dinner time, it was a case of, you know, straight down. You had half an hour and you had two pints there half hour. Then you back the graft. Sometimes somebody clocked you back in. You know, just in case, sometimes you thought, I'm staying down here. <laughs> Somebody's going to clock us in because there was one particular guy in a, in a particular shop and he knew on a Friday that if anybody didn't come back, make sure they clock back out on the night. <laughs> <laughs> and the second time I nearly got sacked was when he's uh, the one who succeeded him, so Bob Reed came to works. I think it was 1981 or 82. Now, on Stores Road, where I was at, at the side of one road, there's three roads, and on the wall, all the way down one road, there's all what you call naked ladies. Page three birds and pornography. And on my corner, I had all my sex pistols and clash posters and everything. And believe it or not, so Bob Reid was offended by some posters and they took them down and it was my posters. So I complained, right? And I was told off the union, are you gay son? Nobody wants to look at men. That's why the women's on the wall. Nobody wants to look at men. But that's how it was in them days, you know what I mean? There was another time, had to put a new belt on the big drop forge as part of a maintenance crew. Uh, so, you know, this huge, I don't know if it was leather or, or whatever it was, but, you know, went all the way over the, the loop and you bolted it on to the top of there, whatever you call it, this huge metal weight. And then the final thing was adjustment at the top. So where you were at the top, where the, it was like a spinning disc that generated the motion. We won a cage around that. And I'm sure it didn't need to be trial run with you still up there on the cage. But they said, right, oh, they let go. And up it went and bang, and the whole thing shook like that. And I was absolutely crapping myself. It felt like war had started. It felt like a bomb had gone off. But uh, yeah, there was smiling faces around. Must have been the, the trick that the, the whichever apprentice got. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was one time when uh, work studies came up to when we were in the whale shop and we were putting the, I had to put the bearings in and they said, look, work studies coming around. So when you're putting the bolts in, he said, put the gun in reverse. So obviously you won't go in. So he said, D just one or two, you know what I mean? D -d reverse. So the works, what's up? Well, I'll have to go and get a tap out. So do I. He says, well, sometimes you've got to tap them out. I know they're being machined. So you get the tap. Right in. And he's there, marking like times down. Straight in. Good next one. Oh, no. Put you, oh, no, it's not regular, you see. So you get another tap. <laughs> tap you know, work studies, of course. Everybody's happy, you know what I mean? He's thinking, right, it takes about four minutes to do a job. It takes you two. <laughs> 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 well, that's one of the things that you get taught from the elders. Yeah. <laughs> <Isn't> it? <laughs> it would probably be your gaffer at the end of the day if you if you were there long enough or it was open long enough. So they knew the scar. It's just a case, like yeah. you say, that's the the friendliness of it. You you were there to work, but no one had a miserable time there. Yeah, you know, it was a great place to be. Uh, Sadly, I didn't get to finish my apprenticeship before it should. That, I think that was the beauty of the place, but I think top and bottom of it, I mean, when talking to my mates that have worked away and they've gone to Doncaster and said children did more work than all the other places. Was it Doncaster made the high caps? I think they followed on doing them. I'm sure it was Doncaster. And well, they said that they, they did less work in the full day because they had to work the full day than children did in three quarters of a shift because everybody chipped in, everybody got the job done, just so they could have a bit of band to sit down. Sometimes you're allowed to play cards. 
You know what I mean? As long as you, you weren't gambling away and chucking money around and stuff like that. It was just a, a friendly game of cards, that sort of format. And it, it was just so, so relaxed. After my, my second placement was in lift and break, and that was, it was an, iso what, an isolated job, so I was bolting these bump stops on the bottom of a, of a coal wagon, basically a big frame with rub rubber bungs on to, st to stop the doors from being damaged when they opened. And it was just, you know, you doing that job. You, you grab the thing up and bolted it on for a week. So, and then moving to say new construction, you were part of a team and you was working with another fitter and a welder and a riveter. So it was all about working together to get things in the right place. And the fitters do their part and the welders do their part kind of thing. So, it was quite, it, was, it could be quite different from, from one environment to another. It was the perks as well. I mean, you got your free rail, railway passes, which was a bonus. Uh, you could go anywhere in the UK. I think you had 16 fr free ones, and then it was a f you paid a third after that. I can remember that one of my first holidays was going to Ostend, and it cost us 99 pence because it wasn't just the railways, the, the, the own sea link and all that, so it, it was, yes, it was a nationalised industry, but it was, I, I thought it would work, but again, maybe I'm biased. It was kind of felt like you're a, you're a man now, you're not a boy, uh, like a rite of passage sort of thing. But it was in the times where you left work, you left school, and you got a job, it, there wasn't, ev you know, jobs were still easy to get. Uh, and yeah, there was, there was better paid jobs than Dunshield and BR. But I don't think you'd have that sense of camaraderie at a smaller factory. It was like, uh, to me, it was just like society. You had little cliques of friends, you had people who you liked, people who you didn't like. But I was, me, I was found the managers and the people who I knew from there were, were fair. Um, like I say, Mike White was the training officer. Um, and I was privileged to know him at work, but also you know, as a friend, as his son's friend. Uh, so no, I, it was happy times. Um, there was a lot of stuff went on at Children that's probably you've never even heard of. Like, um, you know, we, they, had a, they, they looked after orphans. Um, you know, I think a lot of the people put money in every week out of the wage packet into keeping these kids all right. People have less time nowadays, they seem to have less time. Uh, like you say, you have to, there's not work in the town, so you have to drive to it. Uh, so that the travelling time takes more of your day up and you've got less time to pop to the shop or the bank or whatever. So everyone's in a rush, I guess. But yes, people did know each other. You knew, you knew everyone in, four streets either side of you, through your dad or your mum or whatever, mates at school. The best thing, it was just the friendship because whatever you did, you always knew you had somebody watching your back from British Rail Shilden. Um, you know, I travelled about a bit with football and it was always people from Shilden Works who you we went with. If I play cricket and I was lucky enough to open the ball and at a few clubs, uh, opening the ball and at the other end was somebody from British Rail. <laughs> it was, it was very close community and you know, everybody seemed to know everybody. Um, the madness of some people, because there was some, don't know how to put it, but there was some cracks work there. He used to 
fix his bait in a case, big case. That was his bait in there, and they used to take Mickey out of it. He never knew the lumber street flew past you. Oh, he was a right little cracker jack. There's a few of them like that, like. We were all lads and we used to tease them. <laughs> but, uh, oh, it was, oh, like I say, I enjoyed myself down there. I enjoyed working there. Well, there was a famous one who was in, in the repair shop and he used to stuff paper down his boots and his arms, can you remember? Yeah. And he thought that there was like aliens coming for him. And he, he would be working away, as, well, as I think he was a welder, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he'd he, he chuck armour, thinking that somebody was attacking him. Um, then we had one who was a crane driver, I don't know whether Colin can recall, but he, on his head he had a hat and he had a bird's nest in it. Just the, the, the crack, you can, you can talk to people, you can learn from people, you can move on. It's getting an arm around you and bringing you on. And then of course, because it was such a big place, people went out and had a drink together, people went out and had a meal together, which the whole community, it gathered. And of course, when the works went, the whole community went out to show them at the same time. So that's the, that's the thing that I gathered from it, total community. But there's nothing like that now. With no big industries, uh, everywhere's the same. There's, there's all, every, I mean, pub children, I mean, what was there, about 20 or 30? There's about six now, and people don't even go into them. So it's a change in times, and I don't think it's a change for the better. You get people in, people cracking on, no disco jukebox in the background. Everybody's talking, and you can hear the feel, the buzz, of people just cracking away. Fantastic. Can't kind of beat it. I'm sure if, on the reunion night, if there's a top ten of favourite films, it'll be the park parties. So, it, I mean, you wouldn't expect it having its own little shop in the middle of, because you got bacon sandwiches and all sorts. Uh, no, it was just, it was the size of the place that I remember. We moved back because there was no work, and there was four of us moved into the forge, sweeping up. We swept to the bottom, by the time we got to the bottom, it was just as bad at the top again. <laughs> Non-stop it was. Oh, one of the, I can always remember, uh, it, it was football-wise, um, I was just walking round when we were doing this tour as a young apprentice, and this man walked past me, and I, I had to look twice, and you see, I know him, and it was a guy called Wacker Wild. And Wacker Wild was one of the old fullbacks from Shildon. You know, Hope Nicholson and Wild, them were, them were the first three on the team sheet. You think, I'm going to be working with Wacker Wild, <laughs> you know, but the 2,600 men working there, you know, you didn't exactly work with him. But yeah, he, it was great talking to him because he had a lot of stories about the works and football. So yeah, it was nice talking to him. I mean, one of my best memories was, again, when it was closing. And we, I think we'd just come back from the railways and Michael Foote, he used to be the labour leader, and he came and did a talk. And I always remember carrying a chair upstairs to, you know, where he used to have the big, big um, room up. And I remember carrying a chair for Michael Foote. So that's, it's a show with me, but it's one of my memories. For a lot of other people, like big union men, um, you know, we had a lot of visitors come round. You know, it was um, like a lot of people used to enjoy walking, walking around and talking to my dad because he was a big union man. Um, Roy Jones, another big union man, but a lot of experience in the way Shilden Works went. So there was a lot of like well-known people there that you just worked with every day. <laughs> it was just the. It was the size and it was the importance of the place. Yeah. It, was import it was the lifeblood of, like I say, I'm, uh, two and a half, three mile I, I live away from here. But if you take into account all the little villages where people worked and like worked there. Well, it was just their livelihood because there was so many public houses here, so many shops, you know. You, you, you got your money, you earned your money, 
and then you went out and spent it in the town. Um, you know, the two weeks holiday you got, you maybe just went out of the town, but the rest of the time you were spending it in the town. And in my opinion, I don't think it's ever got back to where it, where it was. Outside, I mean, like Jimmy was into punk rock, I, w I was into rock music and metal. So a lot of the people that I knocked about with worked at the railways, plus obviously the people that didn't. But that, there was a core of us that went to rock discos, went to Newcastle, went to Durham, spent him away. So we had like a, a big involvement to go around different places. Shield had something going on with it, because a lot of places did. It was totally different times. You didn't sit in, you went out. Well, there was New Shilton Club. That wasn't far off the place. It used to be even. We used to go there. They used to get all the top team uh, entertainers Anywhere in England, there. Les Dawson, all them. Brilliant they were. Well, I can remember going to New Shilton Club a lot on a Friday night, and it, would, it was just full of BR people and partners. Uh, music be became, well, it was a big thing in my life, so I started to branch out, going to gigs, at, different cities, but there was people that I knew that had similar tastes. And on Friday, over the new club, and you, you think, like I say, that's gone red with Scott. Two massive places, and just wiped out. I mean, this place could be, at the end of the day, it's... It's in it, well, 12 of us down the street on the weekend, with the wives, always down there, the street. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It used to be lovely down there. He, there was also the lake clubs, they are all sourced in the stew. Again, like I say, I, w I went down to Doncaster, and the strange thing was, the manager they got in to basically close the shops went down Doncaster, and he did the same down there. So it was political, definitely. Um, they were brought in to close you, uh, and I can remember some of the machines were. This is back in 1982, 83. They had a whale machine, w which was two and a half, three million pound then. You know, so I, the, until we decided nationalised industry was was no good, it, this was probably high tech. You wouldn't have had to spend all that money on a, on be a, a taxi train centre. You know, millions just had to put a little bit extra money in, a bit more rolling stock. And yes, I can understand what Jimmy said the previous time. It would probably have to be smaller, but there was always a need for it. Well, my dad was, he was uh, in the paint shop. Um, he sprayed all the wagons, a group of them sprayed all the wagons. But my dad was a union man, and he got the chance to go down to London to work at Unity House. Um, Unity House was just up produced and road, where absolutely fantastic job for my dad, but of course it was fantastic for myself and my mother, because we could go down to London. Um, and we were stopping in all these, um, all these places and meeting a lot of people. Um, you know, it's like I've mentioned early on, Sid Wheel. Uh, you know, we were good friends with him. Um, Paul Parker, I think his name one who was chairman of um, British Rail at the time. Good friends with him. When you just got out of work time, they were just normal people. And I was meeting all these people, so, you know, my dad being a spray painter and going to work at British Rail in London, fantastic. Um, he only ever bothered me once, my dad at work. I always remember um, 
getting a pair of Dr. Martens and spraying them silver um, because that's what the football fans did. And he said, if you want your tea when you come home, clean them. <laughs> <laughs> so I was had to do as he was told. <laughs> well, I knew it was a special place. I was uh, down in the dumps because the day they announced the closure was um, St. George's Day, the 23rd of April. Uh, 1982 and at the time the works employed 2,460 men and it opened on the 1st of September 1833 so it had like a long history you know what I mean and it always made a profit and it kept everybody in the town employed and we did a, a dignified campaign and um, I must say the man who helped us the most was uh, Lord Foster, Dewey Foster he's the only MP I've ever had any respect for well, I, I remember I was away on holiday um, and I come back and we got the, got the word that they were going to downsize it. I think it was first 600 men were going to go. Um, a bit of a shock, but we think, well, you know, there's a lot of people who want, you know, the redundancy. But that was just, you know, the first chunk. And um, I think we always said when Mrs Thatcher got made Prime Minister, that's finished. It, you know, it really will finish Shildon, and so be it. Um, and it just destroyed men's lives. And you'll never get that back. Um, it was just a sad time. I went to London on a march, and I knew then we wouldn't. Right. No. no it was all, there, it was all cutting dry before we went. Mm. It's, they don't change their minds, them people. And I wouldn't care, we were the best producers of wagons on the railway. Couldn't believe it. You know, you, you never think it would happen, but I mean, my view was totally political. It was a case of the works were making money. I mean, it's, I mean, my brother was in the, he worked in the offices, so he had a good idea. My dad was high up, he was a foreman. And it was a case of the majority of people knew that Shill was making money, other places weren't, so a case they reorientated, get rid of them, give the jobs down south. And I think it's been proven afterwards. But like I say, it, massive disappointment. Because if it had been like this day and age, you probably would, they wouldn't have got away with it. But because of back then, they, they were in power. It was a case of, yes, we can do what we want. We can pull the plug. It's not affecting them. It's just affecting the jobs up north. They just labour people. It doesn't matter. And that's, that's what I felt. Yeah, well, initially they said they were going to shut, close, uh, let go of and so many hundred jobs. Uh, we were told that you had a, they had a legal, legal obligation not to uh, get rid of apprentices, so we'd be all right until we finished our time. So. You know, when you're young, you don't think that far ahead. I was just kind of thinking, well, I've still got a job anyway. It's sad that people are going to go. But then there was, I can remember being at the, the big meeting at the football ground and being naive and taking in all the speeches from everybody about what we're going to do together to keep it going. And I really thought it would keep going. I could, couldn't comprehend how something that big could just vanish, could just shut down. Me and Colin went to see you too. I think we, we, but were we 18? Yeah, yeah. I think we were 18, maybe 17, 18. Anyhow, we got backstage and they were all like sitting there signing aut autographs. Colin went first and that. And so I had in my head I was going to. Ask him one of these, like, probably a question what he'd heard hundred times. What made you write so, so, Sunday, Bloody Sunday? So I thought, oh, okay. So then, yeah, we've got past all the group, the edge signed it and all that. So we came to Bono and he went, what's your name? I went, um, Des. He went, oh, Desmond, that's a good Irish name. And I went, Bono, can you say a few the shops? <laughs> Just because I, I didn't know what to say. So if it wasn't for me saying that, he would not have been the passionate man what he is it could be a harsh place if you if you most people fitted in but the odd one didn't you would get a lot of stick 
You know what I mean? I, one of my nicknames was the Spotty Punk, because when I went to Doncaster, I was fir my first job at Doncaster was cleaning the toilets in the Crimsel. So every toilet wall I had on, Jimmy from the Crimi you must see him lots because he's covered in spots and that sort of thing. But um, no, I, like I say, I, I'm st I've made lifelong friends from being there. From the day we started, we had to do uh, three weeks ago at York and 12 out of our year came because we were the last year to ever finish our apprenticeships. But I genuinely liked it there, you know what I mean? But, uh, I would still have been never done the shut. And it should have remained open because it always made a profit. But uh, Mrs. Thatcher destroyed more heavy engineering than the Luftwaffe did. She'd close because she was just a nasty bitch. <laughs> she knew she could. She didn't give a damn for anybody else. I think there was a lot of promises. But at the end of the day, we were out the road and they didn't want it. They didn't want to keep it open, else they would have done. Um, you know, we had a march down in London. It did no good. I don't think a lot of people down in London knew where Sheldon was. Um, we had a meeting at, um, at Dean Street, the football ground, where Sid Whale come. At the time, a lot of railway men were going um, to get this deafness award. And Sid Whale said, well, you know, if they're going to come here and say Sheldon, uh, going to close, we're not listening to them, but it did close. You know, I think once the decision was made, it was gone. I don't know what percentage, high percent, maybe 70% of the men in the town definitely worked there. The, my next door neighbour uh, was a secretary for many years in the offices there. Uh, the pay packets were spent locally. It was just meant everything to the town. Uh, you see, you, you pay at the shop on the corner, bakers up the road, butchers, all the money went locally. And the best way to comparison is when I left Doncaster in 1985, I was £138 pound to bring home. Now you take 35 years, pound for pound, you know, most people around here are still on 190 pounds. So you've had 40 pounds. I just think we'd have, we'd have been on a good wage. Probably we'd have had our children wor working and it would have just continued. Um, it was history. You know, we, the thing is, they, they do the children show what we in. They celebrate in the railways. You know, it, it is the, father of of the railways and um stopped there until the sad news come that the works were shutting down um and as people moved out you got moved around um, i went up the, up the right at the top end of the works and um, what they call the break up you had where you burnt wagons to bits and left on the last day yeah but i went on all the marches to london and that and Darlington and, and Bishop and all of that. And uh, we had a fighting fund where everybody donated and that. Um, but if we hadn't campaigned, then we wouldn't have had the chance to, um, I wouldn't have got the opportunity to go to Doncaster, which I spent four good years. At, uh, and then I went to Derby, then I went to York, and ended up with a good job at York. But um, I still believe it should have been open. There's still a need for them but rolling stock now, you know what I mean? When I went down Doncaster, I can remember the miners' strike. And we were getting off the train every Monday, and you could see them with the buckets and all that. And that sticks in my mind because, in a lot of ways, it, it, it was happening to them, which had previously happened to us. It was a pleasure meeting it all. It was an absolute pleasure working with everybody, and it is such a shame that Places like this, places like the steel industries in the 80s got decimated, the miners got decimated because I think it's far better to have people on, which we, we weren't on a brilliant wage to a lot of places around, but because it was, you were part of the community, because you were earning, you could go, you could have a pint, you could have fish and chips, you go into the shops. So there was a corner shop, there was a paper shop, 
There was the groceries just about in every street and everybody mingled. Everybody sort of knew each other. So the whole Shilden, the whole of a concert, they'll have been the same. The mining communities, everybody was buzzing. And once you shut that down, it starves everybody. Then, of course, everybody's looking for work elsewhere because at the beginning of the 80s, there was absolutely nothing. I mean, it was pitiful. I mean, I moved down to Suffolk after uh, being a year up here after leaving the works because there was nothing at all over here. Right. And it's, it is, it's a shame, but I suppose things change. But it's a, yeah, I think it's sort of like a sticks in your throat, the fact is it shouldn't have happened. The Derby, East Lee, quite a lot of the younger, younger lads, they moved to East Lee. Uh, they were all welders and all, off, off the box job, served the town. They were all welders that went. Yeah. I've never seen. I think there was three came back, and two of them was on the old club committee. <laughs> <laughs> Just say I met some nice people. I had some good crack with people. I found some people shits to be fair as well. But no, it's it's something where you and it's all thing to say. This reunion might be the last time you say, say some people because they'll be, they'll be ready for that. You know, I mean, it's telling you something. When me and Colin are 54 and we were the last ever apprentices at the rate, like, not to finish our time here, but to actually start it here. And if you continue having 60 apprentices each year for the last 35 years, again, the economy of the local area would be so different. So yeah, but I think we, I do think that we were shit on to be fair. Oh, fantastic time working with you all. Um, they did me, the lads in the plate and section shop did me a great favour. Um, I always remember, oh, I like called Tommy Lindsay, who was my charge hand. Um, and he all, he come round to me and said, I want words with you here. And he said, from now on, Roger, you were going to do all the scheduling for the lads working. And I said, I just profile burn, that's all I want to do. He said, yes, but look round here, there's a lot of old men who will be finishing work shortly, and you're a young lad. And I always remember Tommy saying that because he's probably helped put me where I am today. I'm a warehouse manager, you know, and he showed, well, showed me how schedules work, how to talk to people, whether they did right or wrong, how to talk to them. And I think that's where I am today. <laughs> and I ended up working for this wind firm and I started down Bishop. Then we got transferred to Aircliff. Then from Aircliff to Darlington. And then I retired. He had a he had New Shilton Club, which is gone now, which was absolutely chocolate on a Friday and Saturday night. It was, again, it was a social aspect. aspect. Yeah, I had so many pubs in Shilden. How many have you got now? Um, had so many little corner shops, news agents. All of them have gone. So it, it, it was probably a death blow for, for the town, and I still don't think it's recovered fully after 35 years. Well, this place, it's a dump now, Shilden. Absolute dump. They've done nothing for this place since the work closed. Nothing. Not a thing. Uh, try and come just to celebrate, not just that we work together, but that we were friends together and have a good day and uh, honour this town. I'd just like to say thank you for, to everyone I met who helped me, who I work with. Every day was good, good fun. Good experience. I'm pleased to have spent time with you all. But no, um, and I just hope that whoever comes just enjoys themselves. Have a have a pint, have a laugh. Probably have several pints, um, and just think of the good times, not the bad times.
Thank you.